Welcome all. In this video, we're going to continue to look at um, basics of exploitation and continue to focus on buffer overflow. So if you missed the earlier videos, I'll add a link here. You can check those out. It's a multi-part series here that uh, is all available on a playlist. So uh, the focus for today is we're going to be looking at actually what do we do once we find a buffer overflow. I've taught this for many years and found that while many folks, many students can uh, you know, can explain this and understand this conceptually when you actually look at performing the overflow and, and taking control of the program, there's many missing gaps. And as you'll see, I think throughout this demonstration, it's actually, you know, there is quite a bit that has to occur here. Um, I'm going to be using a very contrived sample. Actually, we're going to be building off of the sample from earlier in the videos. And you'll see that I'm going to continue to do things, um, you know, disable, you know, modern mitigations in order to make this work. All right, so let's jump right in. Um, first things first, you'll probably notice that there's this fairly large char buffer. Um, so that is an array filled with byte values. And I'm doing this instead of passing this data in through standard in. And I'm doing that for two reasons. One, I'm hoping that it'll just make it a little bit easier to see kind of all the code that we're working with here in this one program. Second, I am doing all of these demos on Windows. You'll see that a lot of the buffer flow uh, literature and examples out there are, are built off of Linux. And part of the reason is that sending this type of data, particularly these you know, non-ASCII hex bytes through standard in, uh, something typically happens to them and they, 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 they kind of modified or transformed. Um, and so it just, it actually makes it kind of tricky. So I figured I'm already doing a sample program. Let's just make this hopefully a little bit more straightforward for understanding. Okay, now if you um, you know, go back and, and check out the videos where we talk about analyzing the stack, what, what we really first have to understand is the layout of our this, the stack that's used for the main function. And in particular, how much data do we need to send in order to exploit this, this stir copy, in order to send this data, this is our source and this is our destination, so that we overflow this buffer and corrupt the return address so that we can subvert the flow of the program. Okay, one way to do this is to look in IDA. And if you just double click on one of these local variables, EBP plus var 10, you'll see that I have converted this to an array. It's a 12 byte array. So even though we, you saw in the code, it was a 10 byte array in order to maintain four byte alignment, the compiler added two bytes. So we've got 12 bytes here plus four bytes. So that's 16 bytes that saved EBP, that's 20 bytes. So we need at least 20 bytes before we start to overwrite EIP. So the 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th byte, then we'll corrupt that return address. And the whole goal is that when this returns, what's on top of the stack after the epilogue is our, our value, our value that will tell the program to go, tell the CPU to go somewhere else. Well, where is that somewhere else? It doesn't just magically pivot and start executing code on the stack. That's what we're focusing on today. So let's go back to our sample program and you'll see that I have 20 A's. Each A, each ASCII character represents 20 bytes. So there's our 20 bytes to overflow the stack. And finally, we have at the end, the slash X, EF slash XBE slash X80 slash SDE. That is, a, that is the notation to represent a byte value using two hex digits. Each hex digit is four bits. So two of those together, one byte. Now you'll notice that this is actually the hex value. If we were to write this out like we normally would, would be zero X D E A D B E E F. So it spells dead beef in hex. And that's just something that I've seen for years when it comes to exploit developers. Um, whatever value you want to put in here, that's fine, right? If we can get dead beef into EIP, then we know that when we see the, the program crash, we've got everything lined up. Okay, now you may be, may be wondering why the last four bytes here are in this sort of fragmented order. Uh, if the value that we're just trying to land, if we were to write this as a normal four byte value, we could write it as such as this, uh, you know, zero X and then dead beef. Why this? Well, that's due to the, 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 the endiness, the architecture's endiness. So it's a little endian, which means that we write the last byte first, which is EF, and then the next byte, which is BE and then AD and then DE. And you can see because we have to write those one byte at a time, that's why it starts to look just a little bit fragmented. So this is important to understand this, 
you know, this composition of memory, because if we can't get this value right, then even if we get it onto the stack in the proper place, if it's out of order, it won't have the desired effect that we're after. Okay, so um, let's see. We've, we're ready. We've got our overflow. We hope to see the program crash. Going to address dead beef. Um, no other modifications at this point in time. So we can save the program and we can go to... And we can go compile. As I've done previously in this video series, we do need to add the dash or the forward slash gs dash flag, which is going to disable those stack cookies. Okay, now I've got the program loaded up in WindyBug and we need to set a breakpoint. I want to set a breakpoint on this return. That way we can just see what's on top of the stack. This is our overflow. So, uh, or this is where our overflow occurs because this is our call to stir copy. So 401031 will be the virtual address with the default image base. Now you'll need to pay attention because this binary right now, since we just compiled it by default, it's going to opt into ASLR or address space layout randomization. That means, as you can see here, that it's going to get a random address whenever it runs. In this case, it's okay. We don't have to do much because we can take the address 401031 and the new image base is 5D0000. So 1031 is the offset from that image base that'll set the correct breakpoint for this particular execution. Now, if we resume execution, you see we did break at that ret and I'm gonna do dump D word ESP. You'll see there is dead beef on top of the stack. So ret's gonna pop that value into EIP. You'll see, of course, you can see it in the register here. When we make the return, and in the disassemble view, because that's where we're going to go. So if we step over, step into, it doesn't matter. There we go, right? There's the address. We crashed at dead beef. Okay, awesome. That's it for this video. In the next video, what we're going to talk about and continue to explore now is how we can take that overflow and the control that we've now gained over EIP and figure out how to begin to execute code on the stack. So hope you stay with me and see you in the next video.